Welcome to Spaceflight Questions and Answers, edition 4.2. Thanks to everyone who asked questions. Many of the answers are in videos that I've done in the past. If you want to find other videos, you can find them by going to eagerspace.net and searching around. On to the questions. How do you see China's private space sector in the coming years? They seem to be making fairly rapid progress given their lack of foundational knowledge. I get asked that often, and I don't know enough about Chinese commercial space to have a meaningful opinion. I linked to a few people who know a lot more near the end of this video. Do you think Blue Origin will beat SpaceX to the moon? Two years ago, I would have said, definitely not. Today, I would say, unlikely. Starship definitely has some issues, but SpaceX has a lot of money, a lot of experience, and a big team. Blue Origin is still working hard to fly New Glenn more than once. I'll also note that the lunar lander contracts aren't like the crew or cargo resupply for ISS, where there were two companies competing to see who was first. SpaceX has the contract for Artemis 3 and 4 right now, and it's not clear if NASA can change that even if Blue Moon is ready earlier. Rocket Lab has mentioned the possibility of a crew capsule, but with the hungry hippo fairing and enclosed upper stage of Neutron, how do you expect them to design for crewed flights versus regular launches? Crew on Neutron is definitely in the, if there is a market, we might do it category. And right now, the market is tiny and served by Dragon. Here's something that I found a little surprising. You can fit a Crew Dragon inside the Neutron payload space if you can fix a small issue with the fins on the trunk. So I think there's no reason you can't put a capsule inside the current design. For abort, you just blow the fairings off and then trigger the abort engine in the capsule. How do they make the Soyuz spacecraft so lightweight compared to other crewed spacecraft? Interesting question. Let's look at some capsules. The workhorse Russian Soyuz consists of three modules. The crew rides in the descent module on both launch and descent, the orbital module gives them more space when they are in orbit, and the service module at the bottom provides power, engines, etc. The descent module is the only part that returns intact. The Chinese capsule uses the same layout as the Soyuz. It's almost like the Chinese adopted the Russian design, but it is slightly upsized. The U.S. and European Orion capsule skips the orbital module, but it is much larger than the others. And finally, the Crew Dragon looks like it has a service module, but the rear section is the hollow trunk. The trunk changes the aerodynamics so the capsule flies forward during abort, provides a location for the solar panels and radiators, and can carry unpressurized cargo inside. As for size, the Soyuz launch mass is 7.1 tons, and 3 tons of that returns. The Shenzhou launch mass is 7.8 tons, and 3.2 tons of that returns. The Orion is a beast, with the capsule massing 10.4 tons by itself, and the service module massing 15.5 tons, for a total of 25.9 tons. It's intended to be a capsule that astronauts can stay in for the long lunar missions, and the service module has enough propellant to get into and out of lunar orbit. It's still very portly. Crew Dragon has a total mass of 12.5 tons, but returns 9.6 tons to the ground. Now let's look inside. The Soyuz carries a crew of three, but has only 3.5 cubic meters of interior volume. Quite a few astronauts have flown on Soyuz. Here is what two of them said. Astronaut Don Pettit said, From a crew comfort viewpoint, the Soyuz is cramped. I might even say cramped squared. Once strapped in, my heels are nearly in contact with my butt. Astronaut Doug Wheelock said, It's incredibly bumpy and hot and cramped. It's kind of like going over Niagara Falls in a barrel, but the barrel is on fire. The positions are bad enough that the crew sometimes takes strong pain relievers before the flight to help them deal with the muscle cramps that result from the position. The reason that Soyuz is so small and cramped is that the Soyuz rocket can only carry about 8.2 tons into low Earth orbit, so the spacecraft is pretty much as heavy as it could be. The Shenzhou capsule also carries three, but it's much larger at six cubic meters. You can see that there is considerably more space than Soyuz. Orion is designed to carry up to six crew, but is currently only planned to fly with four, and the capsule has a palatial 8.9 cubic meters of volume. And finally, Crew Dragon is sized to carry up to seven, but normally carries only four. 
and has 9.3 cubic meters of habitable volume. Discounting Orion, which is really doing a very different job, Crew Dragon is bigger and heavier than the Russian and Chinese capsules for two reasons. The first is that it is designed for a larger crew, and the second is that it is reusable and brings the bulk of the launch mass back to the ground. More mass coming back requires a heavier and more robust heat shield. I've wondered for a while now if Stirling engines would be great at generating electricity in space. Do you know if that sort of power solution has been studied? The small NASA kilopower reactors for lunar surface use are based on Stirling engines. They need large radiators to get rid of the excess heat. Why won't SpaceX develop a disposable upper stage for Super Heavy? They have. Just like there's a disposable Falcon 9 without grid fins or landing legs, take Starship and get rid of the fins, all the heat shield tiles, and the landing fuel tanks, and you have a disposable Starship. My biggest gripe and question is why we still use specific impulse. Like I get the whole easy to translate between units, but it's horribly unintuitive for me. Wikipedia says the following about specific impulse in reference to rockets. Specific impulse, measured in seconds, can be thought of as how many seconds one kilogram of fuel can produce one kilogram of thrust. This definition has little utility. The rocket equation is based on exhaust velocity, which is far more intuitive in my opinion. But we're stuck with specific impulse because that's what has always been used. Just use it as if it were dimensionless. Do you think Starlink and similar systems provide a genuine benefit to humanity that extends beyond providing competition to particularly greedy internet companies in rich countries, or giving scientists in remote places opportunity to scroll social media? Yes. Estimates for how many people do not have internet access range from 2.5 billion to 2.9 billion, or roughly 35% of the world's population. In the long run, which is better, a reusable launch vehicle that only flies occasionally, or a mass-produced expendable rocket that is launched frequently? Too many variables to answer. There are cases where reuse is hugely useful in terms of overall company aims. Falcon 9 is the obvious case here. There are other cases where reuse makes little sense. Vulcan is an example of this right now. Do you think SpaceX would have failed if not for some lucky timing and appallingly bad decisions or performance by established competitors? Absolutely. Here's a video for you. Any interest in exploring European or Russian space industry? I know you're not interested in the Chinese launch industry, but is that the same with all non-American industries? It's not that I'm not interested in the Chinese launch industry. I just don't think I have anything useful to say about it. I've talked a little about the EU space program. Russia is hard to talk about because none of their official information is trustworthy, and you therefore need insider sources, which I don't have. I've also talked a little bit about India's ISRO, and we'll probably talk about it more in the future. Do you think Congress will create a new launcher for NASA after they are unable to justify SLS? And what do you believe they could justify? Congress has never felt the need to justify SLS, and I'm not sure they would change that post-SLS. The Space Act of 2010 that created SLS pretty much said the following. Build us a big-ass rocket that could be used to put 70 to 100 tons in low Earth orbit, and we like that Orion capsule. Keep working on that. Make sure you use shuttle technology and existing contracts as much as possible. They talk about deep space, but they never define a specific mission. I don't think that this sort of thing is going to change. Do you think Starliner still has any chance of actually flying astronauts to the ISS with the deorbit date quickly approaching? After the early issues, I thought that Starliner still had a good chance. And then after the one-way crew flight and Boeing's other issues, I felt strongly there wasn't a good business case for it. Boeing has since then sold a bunch of new stock, and they've been working on a thruster redesign, so I'm not sure anybody should care about my opinion now. It is true that the longer they wait, the less money there is in the ISS contract, and it's not clear what post-ISS business there might be from the I Hate Dragon contingent. What are some of the technical complexities of orbital refueling? And has anyone achieved it in the past, before Starship and Blue Origin? I talk a bit about propellant depots in this video. From a technical standpoint, orbital refueling isn't a big challenge. 
It hasn't been done in the past because nobody wanted a mission architecture that required a propellant depot. As for why NASA hasn't done it, Eric Berger shared this quote about Alabama Senator Richard Shelby. Senator Shelby called NASA and said if he hears one more word about propellant depots, he's going to cancel the space technology program. NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center is in Alabama, and it owns, among other things, management of the SLS rocket. Berger wrote an article for Ars Technica titled, So Long, Richard Shelby, and Thanks for All the Pork, that goes into more detail. Any thoughts on chemical cislunar tugs refueled from near-Earth asteroids and or processed lunar regolith? Two questions come to mind. The first is, what sort of market is there for cislunar tugs? That seems very hard to predict. The second is, how much will it cost to research, design, develop, transport, and operate facilities that can do this, and can you build a business around it? There are certainly technical challenges, but the big question is, who is going to pay to do it, and why? Outside of internet slash observation, what commercial markets are promising in the satellite industry? NASA has tried to answer this question with ISS for years, and hasn't really come up with any good answers. I talk about it a bit in my Free Flyers video. My short answer is that there might be something related to manufacturing, but it's too soon to tell. I don't think there's a meaningful market for tourism, even if transportation is much cheaper. In the future, if nuclear fusion ever becomes practical and modular, would it open up new possibilities for engines? There are many fusion rocket engine designs floating around, including the Sunbird from Pulsar Fusion. It's possible they can work, and if they do, you can just let the products of fusion, or at least some of them, escape out the back. That gives you really high specific impulse. Whether it gives you enough thrust to be interesting isn't clear right now. A big problem that I see is that you need a lot of power input to get a fusion reaction started. If you use inertial confinement, you need a ton of power to drive your lasers, and if you use magnetic confinement, a ton of power to heat the plasma and perhaps to get your magnets up and running. That's not a problem for a terrestrial power plant, but it seems to be a significant barrier for a spacecraft. Could Auriga space succeed? Auriga is trying to use electric propulsion to do hypersonic testing, suborbital launches, and ultimately orbital launches. I talk about electromagnetic launchers in my Guns to Space video. It's theoretically possible, but you have many of the same issues that Spin Launch had. You need to design payloads that are very resistant to high G-loads, deal with heating and noise as they travel through the atmosphere at high speed, and you're going to invest a ton of money into development before you get any customer back. They can probably get to hypersonic testing for some values of hypersonic. The suborbital market doesn't have a lot of money in it except for space tourism, and this launcher can't carry people. I think it's unlikely they get to orbit. Why is Starship V2 such a disaster? Here's a video for you. Do you think Starship will ever carry humans? I'm concerned about its vulnerability to debris impacts and its complete lack of redundancy. This video is a bit out of date, but my thoughts are mostly the same. Can you do a video on rotivators and maybe the ones Tethers Unlimited might do? I dream of hundreds of short 20 kilometer rotivators flinging starships in stack shelled orbits to go beyond the tyranny of the rocket equation. A video on non-rocket space launch is somewhere on my topic list, but it's honestly not very high on the list, as I struggle to see how they might ever be practical. They generally are hyper expensive, time consuming to build, the effects of atomic oxygen on them may be an issue, simple to attack, and if anything happens to them, they may deorbit directly on top of a populated area. Do you think rotating detonation engines would be feasible in terms of manufacturing, economy, and performance for a mass-produced rocket like Falcon 9? There's a short answer in this video. I'm skeptical and there isn't much real data out there. I put them in the same class as aerospike engines, though I'm pretty sure that aerospikes aren't practical and not sure about RDE engines. What are your thoughts on the possibility of SpaceX hosting customer payloads on Starlink satellites? It's going to depend on the scenario, what a customer wants to do, how that would impact the satellite design, and how much they are willing to pay for the capability, and whether their business model works in the long run. There's a pretty high barrier, 
Starlink needs to be very reliable and they need to be spending the vast majority of their mass budget on serving their actual customers. I'd say probably not. How will Starship come back from Mars? Would it need to refuel in low Mars orbit? How many radiators will it need to stop cryogenic fuels from boiling off? It's much easier to get from the surface of Mars into orbit than from Earth because of the lower gravity and lack of atmosphere. A fully fueled starship can get into orbit and all the way back to Earth, assuming the design works out the way I expect it to work out. If you're not yet making fuel on the surface, it would be better to refuel in orbit. You don't want to drop fuel to the surface only to bring it back up into space. As for radiators, see my propellant depot video. I don't think keeping the propellants cold is a major issue, and they have to do some of that going to Mars anyway. What approach for full reusability is more feasible, realistic, or easy to realize? Starship or Stoke Spaces Nova? That's easy. We don't know. Both approaches are under development, and they're both trying to do things that have never been done. SpaceX has clearly run into some issues along the way, and it's likely that Stoke will also run into issues along the way. And it's not clear that full reusability is going to be the winner as it imposes a significant payload penalty. Maybe the stupid cheap second stage approach that Neutron is taking will turn out to be better. In your opinion, as of pre-launch of Starship Flight 10, has SpaceX learned enough from the past few launches, or attempts, to have a better or worse track record with Block 3 Starship compared to Block 2 Starship? It's post-Flight 10, which was successful, but my opinion is still the same. If Block 3 isn't much, much better than the early Block 2 Starships, the program is in real trouble. How do you think we could make human spaceflight actually cheaper and have a good business case? I know that many people will default to robots better, but I've always felt that to be an oversimplification that assumes human spaceflight will always remain as expensive and as limited as it is now. It's all about the market. If you have a compelling reason for people to do useful things in space, that gives you a useful size market and somebody will serve that market. Right now, with dragon costs, there's a market for about four people a year to go into orbit, and that's costing on the order of $50 million per person. How expensive do you expect one Starship launch to be when the system is fully reusable and a few years in service? Some math to support that, please. Fuel, people, materials. You'll find various people making assertions around how much Starship will cost and how much payload it will carry. I made some predictions early on, and I do still have a Starship model, but I don't think anybody outside SpaceX has data that is good enough for estimates. I'm not even sure that SpaceX has good enough data for estimates. But that's unsatisfying, so let's see if we can put in some bounds. At the low end, commercial airlines operate at three to four times their cost of fuel. Fuel for Starship is supposedly about a million dollars, so let's say the lower bound is five million. Starship probably doesn't have passengers to deal with, which makes it simpler, but many airliners spend half their lifetime in the air, and that spreads out the fixed costs and the plane costs over many, many flights. Starship won't have that, so I think $5 million is in the right ballpark. On the high end, the heaviest Falcon is a decent benchmark, and that probably costs SpaceX about $60 million. I'd say somewhere between the two. I'm confident on the low end, not so confident on the high end. And note that these are costs, not prices. Could heat pumps be used to increase the temperature of waste heat to make radiators more efficient? Here's a paper for you to look at. It says, A typical heat pump providing a large temperature lift, close to 60 degrees centigrade, could reduce the satellite's radiator surface area by a factor close to 1.4. This is a significant potential reduction. The decision on whether to pursue this approach compared to alternatives, such as deployable radiators, should consider the relative complexity, cost, weight, size, and reliability of the two options. Why weren't Methalox engines as popular in the past as they are today? There's a video for that. And that's the last question and answer for this episode. If you enjoyed this video, Listen to this. Eager space.